welcome to Black Panther Unmasked, curated by Brisk. What an incredible event this is in downtown Los Angeles. This is a very special episode of Collider Movie Talk. We're going to be joined in just a little bit by a few panelists that you guys all know and love out there, plus the costume designer of the movie Black Panther is here herself, Miss Ruthie Carter. Let her know. We have an incredible crowd here. My name is Mark Ellis. I'm a comedian. I'm a host. They let me do stuff like this. This is my Martin Freeman cosplay. Does everybody think it's good? This is my Everett Ross getup. It was either that or Claw, so I picked the right guy. And I'm just happy to be here in front of you guys, and I'll tell you why. It's because this movie means so much to so many different people. And before I bring up any panelists, I just need to know from everybody out there in the crowd, round of applause if you've seen the movie already. <laughs> seen the movie. Black Panther. I want to be fair to everybody. Let's not judge. As anybody clap right now if you have not seen Black Panther yet. <laughs> that means now we can't spoil the movie because two people have not seen it. But it's cool. We're going to respect you. One of the guys working here has actually not seen the movie yet. He's too busy taking care of us to go see the flick yet. Hopefully you get a chance to check it out soon. It's a movie that, if you guys follow the news, has been seen by a whole lot of folks. And I am thrilled right now, without further ado, to introduce two of them who happen to be two of the favorite panelists that we have on Collider. First, coming to the stage is one of the rising stars in this industry. You guys know her not only from her appearances on Collider, but one of the hosts of Black Girl Nerds and Animation Weekly on AfterBuzz. Miss Joelle Monique is here. <laughs> Joelle Monique, and he is the host of Collider Heroes, you guys know him from his movie that he directed, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, and he happens to be the director of the Black Panther animated series, Mr. John Schnepp, everybody. It was, uh, it was funny hanging out with you guys backstage because uh, I apparently was the one to break the news to Joelle that John Schnepp was the director <laughs> of the Black Panther animated series. I when really you heard no that, idea. you look at him in a different light now. It, it, like, she got sweaty. His knowledge is impressive before, and then now this. I, didn't, I had no idea. It was fun. I worked on a couple of the episodes with Reggie Hudlin. He's an awesome dude. It's amazing. so cool to see a movie like Black Panther go from being a, one, of the, one of the Marvel properties that comic book fans loved, and they celebrated the animated series, and then blow up into this worldwide phenomenon. So I wanted to get y'all's quick take on just the movie in general. Joel, what does all of this, this hoopla, this hype surrounding Black Panther mean to you? Do I have the rest of the half hour to <laughs> explain my love for Black Please Panther? Please sum up your thoughts of an entire lifetime in 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell the story I tell everybody, which is the first time I saw this, I sat in front of like an 84-year-old man who'd been reading comics since World War II. Like, he's a hyper fan. I watched the movie, it's emotional, it's amazing. Some of you know, some of you will know very soon. Uh, when I turn around, this guy's entire face is wet. Like, the whole, he is drenched in just happy tears. And I was like, <laughs> and that's all you really need to know about the movie, is that it's going to touch your heart. Um, it's gonna show you things you haven't seen before. And then, of course, my new love, Shuri, who's just, everything I didn't know I needed in black female empowerment. She's amazing, so I love this movie. So you literally saw the movie with a guy who read comics since World War II. He yeah. was reading Captain America before Captain America became Captain America. It's true, yeah, no, he was, he was into the books. He was there for the first Black Panther. He has some of the original books. Like, he's hardcore into it. And so to see the joy in his face, like, you, there, you can't ask for anything more than that. It's a generational event. I mean, it's not just limited to one, uh, you know, a group of people or one age of people. And John Schnepp, somebody who was so familiar with the comic book and then coming to work on the animated series, what was the progression of this fandom like for you, watching this crazy train that was leading up to the Black Panther release? Well, let me say this. I mean, having seen Black Panther, I cannot believe how well they got it right. I mean, it is... Uh, having been a fan uh, from the 70s growing up, reading the reprints of the Fantastic Four, and that's how I first learned about T'Challa and Wakanda and Vibranium and Claw and all that kind of stuff. And I, don't, I didn't need to see, well, I, don't, I can't talk about it. I almost did a spoiler right there. You know me, I love Ooh. spoiling stuff. Won't get deep Whoa. about that. Backtrack. Um, so anyway, go see the movie. Who, who hasn't seen the movie? Raise your hand. By sound. Wow. There's, no, awesome. That's okay, guys. Well, it's there for the, you. For the live viewers, I'm not going to do any spoilers. But anyway, <laughs> uh, from the comic book and having read so many different iterations 
of the comic book all the way to the present. I think the movie does a great job, just like all the Marvel movies, of encapsulating what's the greatest stuff from the origins in the early 60s all the way up to the present stories now. So I love it. What's incredible about it is that people who haven't seen Black Panther, they can be excused because they probably didn't get to get tickets because their theater was sold out. Like, right. this movie is breaking box office records. It made $25 million on Thursday night. Day one, y'all. Can you? Day one. Can you imagine waking up on Friday morning with $25 million in your bank account? And then you <laughs> add $75 million on Friday. So now people are estimating this could do upwards of $180 for the three-day weekend. It's President's Day weekend. Could do over $210. I like that. The, the numbers, this is, I feel like I'm doing a box office, like a, like a, it's, it's like a stock market show where it just keeps buying. Yeah, like 150, 150, 175, 180, 210, what's that? John Schnepp, you see the box office, do you, what does this do for the future of cinema in general and comic book movies? Well, I mean, for the future of cinema in general, it, it puts a very large stamp on Black Panthers, like, beat this. And it's, I, don't, I don't think anything's going to come close except for the next movie that T'Challa's in, which is Infinity War. So that's like 235 <laughs> or something like that. So, But yeah, I mean, it shows you that people are excited about seeing a really well-done story. So that's what it shows me. Well, and hopefully it allows for more films like this to be made in the future, because things we hear constantly is like, there's not a market for films like this. Like, who's going to see a movie entirely encapsulated with black folks? Like, a whole bunch of people are going to go see it because it's an awesome story, and it looks cool. <laughs> like, that's all we really need. So hopefully we see more of this. I want to see it spread to other populations. Yeah, y you and I have had conversations that linked about how representation really does matter and that people support things like this, especially when it, when it feels new and it feels exciting. But I think that this is a great harbinger for the future of, of having a cast that, like you said, it's a primarily black cast, but everybody, this story is touching everybody emotionally. It's, it's not made for one group of people, it's made for everybody to celebrate. As you already said, cross-generational, it doesn't matter like who you are, or even if you haven't seen anything of the Marvel Universe, like none of that matters. You can come in and enjoy this movie start to finish, like fresh, it's that good. And one of the reasons why the movie is so good is actually joining us here today. I would love to introduce, and it is my pleasure to now welcome to the stage the costume designer for Black Panther, the one, the only, Miss Ruth E. Carter, everybody. Let her hear it. You know that you're you're a special celebrity at an event like this when you get escorted to the stage. Like <laughs> they just gave me a mic and said, "Find your way to the stage." <laughs> Ruth has an entourage just helping her get around everywhere. It was, the heels. It, was it was all in the heels. And like th the first question I have for you, and it's by the way, it's great on a personal level because we're both from the same area yeah. in yeah. in Virginia. And um, if I could just ask you because you've worked on movies for the better part of, of three decades uh -huh, now, being uh -huh. a costume designer in various forms. I mean, you as far back as even predating a movie like Malcolm X, which you worked on, a recent movie like Selma. Mm -hmm. What was the experience of Black Panther? As an artist, you start working on something new and you're gonna learn more things about yourself and yeah, about yeah. your craft. What did the experience of working on Black Panther teach you that you did not know before? Um, well, I had to rely on what I knew before because it was such a massive project and I figured that the reason they, uh, Ryan asked for me and Marvel agreed was uh, based on what I had done before. Um, so I, I thought about my artistry and, and what I love to do and I brought that to the table first. And I guess through the experience of, of getting everybody in the various costume looks and really having to you know think really deeply about Africa and how I how we all wanted it to be very royal you know I was never I was challenged every day I was never ever relaxed and saying you know I got this I was challenged every day so anytime there was a new costume in its development um, it was a it was an exercise of how do we make this different and how do we present it in the right way how do we well, how do we dispel stereotypes and myths and so that was constantly in the foreground of my mind when I picked fabrics, when I evaluated the end results. I mean, I looked at the uh, Dora prototypes, uh, different elements of the Dora several times and, you know, really got emotional about it because it just had to be right. If there was something that I felt looked like a costume where I was like, this is not the Lion King, folks. You know, we are going to make this 
we are going to make this and we're going to make this right if I have to, you know, lay down and die for it. So I, I guess through that, that in the intensity of that experience, I mean, I look at pictures of myself standing on set, or I remember seeing, someone sent me recently a picture of myself in the makeup room when they were putting a, a headpiece on one of the uh, tribal elders, and I, you, I look like I have lasers coming out of my eyeballs. I'm just like focused. I'm like uber focused, and that's probably why I was so tired and I was so drained. But in the end, going to your question, I just felt like, you know, believe in yourself, believe in your, your art, yep. believe that you have what it takes. Don't worry about that it's Marvel and you have to live up to a certain standard. You are the standard. And, you know, what you are going to bring to it, if it comes from the heart, everybody will feel it. And that's what I took at the end. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I wanted to ask you about working with makeup and hair because these are like looks like completed finalized head to toe amazing looks and I think usually it takes a, a film of like historic uh, proper like to be a historical film for us to be like oh my gosh that dress was so representative of time and it's beautiful we're walking out of Black Panther like with favorite looks like I know guys looking for that blue and green suit already they're like where can I buy it how do I make it it's gorgeous how did you guys work together to collaborate on some of these looks well, I come on before hair and makeup, and I'm, uh, I, you know, from my past films, I'm a stickler for research. And so if you walk into the costume area, basically I have a vision board is the size of the one wall in the warehouse where I have Dogon masks. I have one representation of every tribe. I have the Lesotho blankets up on the wall. I have examples of vibranium and how we're gonna infuse that. I mean, there is a vision board. And then as you travel through, you're gonna see fabrics, you're gonna see beads all organized by color. You're gonna see uh, mood boards that travel through it's a lot like that room in there that I love, <laughs> the comic room. But you're going to travel through. You're going to see the Dogon tribe, the Himba tribe. You're going to have inspiration. So by the time they come on, we walk through the images. And we talk about you know, how, what this means and how we're going to create this collaboration of African artifacts. We're not doing a documentary. We're not taking it from an anthropological point of view. We're moving it ahead and we're presenting it in a futuristic model so that we can all kind of dream about this world of Wakanda. So they look at, we don't, we don't have enough time. For, for me to dictate the hair takes my mind into a whole nother uh, path that I don't need to be on. They're, they're, they're hired because they're experts and they're gonna take my lead. They're gonna look Look at my research, they're gonna look at my fitting photos, they're gonna look at my illustrations, and they're gonna take the lead. They're gonna take it, I expect them to take it to another level. I cannot wait for you to be Oscar nominated for your costume design. Yes. 2018, you're looking at the winner right here. Right. She's got it in the bag. I mean, you got Colleen Atwood on the run. You know what I'm Colleen, get out of here. Yeah, no, sorry. we love you, Colleen. But you know what? I want to ask you. I want to ask you, like, from the comic book perspective, what designs did you look at? Because I saw Kirby coming out, as well as like a world design. So many beautiful colors, but all of it kind of woven in this kind of that futuristic Wakandan vibe. What did you look to? Well, you know, there's a visual develop development department run by Ryan Minerding. Do you guys know him? Oh yeah. Oh, him yeah. and Andy Andy Parks. Okay. Parks, who's right. here? You should know who these people are. Anyway, Ryan Minerding is the head of visual development. They, they, they developed that panther suit long before I get there. And so I have to rely on their knowledge of comics. I mean, he did Captain America. He is the man over there. And I have to rely on their uh, history of the comics because I don't, have a I don't have time to figure it all out. I'm looking at everybody's comics. I'm looking at Reggie Hudlin. I'm looking at Priest. I'm looking at Tanashi Coates, Tanahishi Coates. Yeah. Um, and, but what I could tell is, I mean, even when you walk through this room, you get a sense of it, but you don't get the details. So for a film medium, you have to really bring the details. And that was my job, to infuse more Africa into Wakanda, to give everybody an actual signature to their look. 
you know, and to employ those people that are going to do the proper crafts. You know, I had a jewelry maker doing the, the necklaces on the Dora. You know, we had people who were experts at mold making. And then I had to like beat the African thing. I had to beat the, the African drum all day. Walk through the office beating the drum because, you know, people don't necessarily know how deep that, that continent can go. They don't realize it's a wealth of resource for art. And so you have to actually train people from point A. They may be great, they may be at Z if with what they know about making a mold or doing leather craft or creating a costume, but they may not know that they're creating a stereotype. And so my, my job is to bring the artistry of the the continent to the close. Uh, you set a goal and you reached it. <laughs> it was beautiful. I'm curious to know your thoughts on, we're getting a lot of photos online of little girls, uh, a lot of girl clicks coming as a dormilage to the movies. What is it like to see your costumes on the next generation, seeing these girls get excited to portray the women that you've kind of helped create? Okay, so this is an emotional question. I understand. Uh, you know, I'm an advocate of little girls that don't really want to show their bodies. And they can now be Doras. They can be Shuri's. They don't have to wear a tube top and a cheerleader skirt to be a superhero. I mean, us grown women, we can. But <laughs> it's really about empowerment. And it's about uh, honoring, really, what the, the, the multi-dimensional qualities of women. And so, I feel like in this film, you know, I, I thought about it, but I didn't focus on it when we were creating it. But I knew there was a mother, there's a queen, there's a sister, there's a, there's a badass, you know, uh, a warrior, um, there's a spy, there's a girlfriend. I, we covered it. So I feel that the images that I have presented um, in the Black Panther uh, really do speak to all women in a real positive way. And I think it helps the comic book world to reimagine a new world and a new way of, of expressing femininity and power. Yeah. I'd like to add on to that, like, I mean, you did such a great job at, at realizing Wakanda and making it feel like a real lived-in world. What is it that, like, you looked at specifically when you looked at artists, like, to see what kind of things, like, felt realistic to you? Oh, um, specifically uh, when I compared the comics to the thing. Uh, well, you know, that's the thing about the comics. There's no specifics. There is, a, there is a broad brush. And so specifically in that broad sense, when I saw the Tribal Council, that really, uh, that really kind of spoke to me about what we were going to do in the Tribal Council. Because, you know, in the comics, you'll see a man with a suit and he'll have a Maasai headdress on. Or, you know, you'll see some wearable tech, you know. and uh, when we went to tribal council, Ryan Coogler, I must say, and with a pause, uh, <laughs> he had very specific ideas about what the tribal council would look like. He, he wanted the, the Himba headdress that the mining tribe elder uh, is wearing. He asked for the lip plate on the river tribe elder, but we gave him an Oswald Boateng suit. So it did, yeah, did feel very comic book-like. I mean, that was one of the first um, fan art that I started seeing was that lip plate in that green suit, which I felt really, really proud that we could bring an aesthetic to it that honored the comic books, but was all ours. It was fun to watch how authentic, because this movie, while a, a good portion of it does take place within the kingdom of Wakanda, it really spans the globe. And so for me to, to know who you were going into the movie and to see what Los Angeles looked like back in the day, back when you first started working on movies, yeah. it, it felt so authentic because that's your era when you came into this industry. And so you can see the costumes and it really felt accurate with reflecting the early 90s culture and how people dressed with that. Oh yeah, that, I lived through that. <laughs> uh, them gold chains the and those, those oversized shirt, double, double light white t-shirt underneath the court colored t-shirt, showing your little tank top a little bit. Oh yeah, lived through that, lived through all of that. Um, but didn't live through that with Oakland. That was the difference. That's where we needed Ryan because you know the uh, Oakland kind of was in competition with LA. 
So Oakland brothers didn't want to really wear, they didn't want to rock the LA look. I was out here in LA. So I was trying to rock, you know, the LA side of thing and put some Chuck Taylors on with, you know, with the Wrangler jeans and the oversized t-shirts. And he was like, no, 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 that's the LA thing. You got to do some Jordans. You got to get Jordans. So I was on a mad search everywhere for real Jordans, and he knew them so well from the from the '90s when I'd uh, order a pair of Jordans online. Uh, he would go like, "Ah, oh, no, 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 no." <laughs> that's real. That's real. That's now. You know, you got to get some vintage Jordans out here. So I was on a quest for Oakland. 90s. There's got to be no better feeling than have like the Marvel Company card searching for Jordans online. Like that's that's the best possible day for a costume designer. Like this costs how much? It's not my money, so I can spend it. Yeah, exactly. Oh no, we had a store. We had a little store going. Yep. But you know the nice thing about buying online is you can return it. You don't have to even face the person. You just <laughs> send it back. That's a great tip for all you budding costume designers out there. Just buy it at Target. Do the shoot, and then the next day, hey, this didn't fit right. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, they don't. They don't care. I think we have uh, we have time quickly for one more question from each of our panelists. If you guys have anything else in your brain, I know there's there's so much we want to get to. Yeah. Uh, so when they make the sequel to Black Panther, they should be announcing it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to see. It's gonna happen. We'd love to see what what have you got planned that you didn't get to do in this movie. Oh, you know, I, the first time I saw the movie, I felt like I was under fire. You know, I was like, oh, my God, there's that. Oh, I put that in there, too. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> um, but there were some amazing things that were cut. Mm -hmm. And I was so upset about them. There was a tribal council that was, there was a Ramonda look. I, I actually, when you see the poster, you'll see uh, Angela Bassett from the side. She has a big, huge piece of amethyst in the middle of a breast, uh, a uh, plate, a breastplate. And I, I created that because I wanted that to represent like Ramonda, who was the queen of Wakanda, would have also maybe been Adora at one point. And this is now her queenly armor. She's gonna wear adorn an yes. armor piece. And it got cut. No. So I said, okay, if they ask me, and even if they don't, <laughs> we're going to put that one in the next one. <laughs> yes, I love that. Uh, I wanted to ask you about one final look. Uh, Without giving away any spoilers, the Korea scene is one of my favorite moments in the entire film. Uh, and you created these like impeccable dresses that they could kick so much butt in. It was really cool. And I wanted to know how you, how do you like, especially the red dress that Denai wore when she's on top of the car. This is in the trailer, so I'm not spoiling anything. When she's on top of the car and it's flowing behind her like Superman's cape, it's so epic. How much like structural testing did you get to do to make sure that it was gonna give you that cape-like look and that they could fight in it? Uh, that was one of the first designs I done did done back in September, and uh, I had a special person come in who had worked for the ballet. Uh, she had worked 25 years for the Boston Ballet, and she s knew the fabric and she knew how uh, how those layers could kind of uh, move. And uh, we worked on that dress for about three months. Wow. We tested it on top of the car with a stunt girl. We had a wow. we had a a kind of a muslin that was made out of the same fabric. We started with that. Were there enough layers? We needed that. It basically had about five layers underneath. I wanted it to really like fly up in yeah. the air. You know, I thought visual effects would take it and just like make it totally <laughs> animated. I had this whole idea in my head. Um, and they had to do very little to it because it really did have the movement when, and it flowed with her. And it took like a dance uh, expert uh, dance costume es expert to help me get through that. It was beautiful. <laughs> One of the things that I loved about watching the movie is the dichotomy between the decision making that T'Challa is faced with versus his rival Killmonger and that they bring such a different world view to the table and you can see both their perspectives. It's not just a, though this is definitely the good guy and this is the bad guy. There's a lot more interesting layers going on. So as somebody who's costuming each one of these individuals, do you have to approach that from, this is how he sees the world versus how he looks at the world? Because T'Challa is not about flair. He's not about showing off where Killmonger wants to display that a little bit more. Are you asking me if there's another costume designer? <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, I'm just, I'm just spitballing here. Okay, yeah. Um, their characters are very different, and actually, as actors, they're very different. As people, they're very different. So uh, my uh, fitting room is a transformation process. So uh, you know, Michael Jordan comes in with his energy, and he's like pumped up, and uh, Chadwick Boseman comes into the fitting room with his energy, and he's just very very zen. So, you know, they did great casting. It wasn't hard to like bring them into the world their their world. They have the talent, they have the thought process. They can embody the clothes. It's just we have to meet them there. Michael B. Jordan's uh, fittings were racks and racks and racks of clothes because he re re represented the lost tribe. He represented the African American. So, it was important that he be this uh, unapologetic guy that we all see we all know who know who got his shit together and, and can articulate but at first glance you're wondering you know like who this character is in the in the museum you know all the securities around him the man the director of the museum comes may I help you you know and then he spits out some knowledge um, T'Challa on the other hand we expect him to be a knowledgeable a quiet kind of a quiet warrior, and uh, his clothes had to represent someone who was not a part of a world that was colonized and then enslaved and then moved to another country. He had to embody a person who represented the pureness of, uh, of Wakanda and keeping, uh, keeping everything secure. So his clothes was a lot, were a lot more elegant, and we tried to uh, come up with ideas that um, were unique. So all of his stuff was made, as opposed to Michael B. Jordan, and all of his stuff was bought. In summation, and I, I, I cannot tell you how much we all appreciate you lending some of your time so we can ask you these questions here today. I, I think I'd like to end on this, is that you put the work in, and you do a great job, and like you said, you have a singular focus each day as to what you're going to work on, and you just hope it all comes together in an incredible product. The first time you got a chance, to check out the movie in its finished form. What was that like for you uh, emotionally? Do you, do you just take it all in? Do you take a breath? Did something surprise you? Can you describe that experience for us from your perspective? Um, I feel like I'm looking at it in the same way that you are uh, after I see it a couple of times. It takes me a couple of times. That's my process, sorry. I, can't, I look at the costumes first and I don't even remember what people said. <laughs> but. Then after a couple times, I can actually see the movie and actually hear the dialogue and under and see the relationships. And you know, some of the uh, I, what I think are the mistakes or some of the little things that I I stress out about about the clothes. They all of a sudden they don't matter anymore because like whoa, what he's saying is more important. How about that? And. And I actually like this story, and I'm actually because you know when we make the movie, there's re there's re um, the script is not finished, so you know you're making a story about a world in a new world, a futuristic world, a comic book world, African world. But sometimes the scenes that you read and you committed to are are taken out, and a new scene is written. And you're not always given the pages. My crew's never given the pages. They're never given the script. It's only the department heads, because you know Marvel's like the CIA in that way. <laughs> so you have to kind of be committed to the art and, and follow the director's lead. Know that Ryan Coogler is the right man for the job, and he's going he's gonna to tell you that if this ain't right, then it ain't right, you know? So I'm watching it the same way you are in some ways because I'm re I'm reunited uh, with the whole story in totality from beginning to end. So at, there's a point, like I'm at that point now in my fourth viewing that I can actually relax. On your fourth viewing, you can just go in and actually relax and enjoy it. And I think I speak for a lot of people in the room when I say that we go to the movie and we see it, we kind of watch it backwards from you because we go to see it and we're looking at the story and we're, and we're just soaking it all in. And then we need to go see it again and again to check out some of the details that you put in there on the costumes because it truly is a singular experience. And on behalf of the panel, I want to thank Ruthie e. Carter for joining us yeah. here today. Um, Thank you so much to all you guys who are watching out there. Thank you to everybody who showed up. John Schnepp, Joel Monique. I am merely Mark Ellis. This is the Black Panther costume designer, Ruthie Carter. Thank you all for watching this very special edition of Collider Movie Talk from Black Panther Unmasked, curated by Brisk. You all subscribe right here to Collider Video, and make sure you go check out Black Panther. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you all real yeah. soon.